Hey everybody, we got another amazing episode of the Contractor Business Builder podcast. We have the honor of hosting Les O'Hara again. He's the founder of the Contractor Huddle, as well as owner of North Shore Masonry. Tons of experience. Looking forward to jumping into a whole bunch of great content here. How are you doing today, Les? Derek, I'm honored to uh, be back on again. You were one of the first podcasts I ever got on and love seeing your stuff all over YouTube. You're one of my favorite subscriptions. So to be back on. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a special episode for sure. Uh, last one, you know, we talked about so much stuff that was just, uh, I mean, you, you, you're in the contracting world, you've grown your own businesses. Now you coach other contractors and you have a real good insights into financial management of businesses too, which is a really strong suit of yours. So can you tell us a bit about your, your background and the work that you do now? Sure. So 30 plus years in the trades, yeah. uh, started in the family roofing business, grew that, scaled it, ended up selling that, having a successful exit there, and then had a lot of entrepreneur. I get bored easy. So I started different companies. Uh, one was a two-time national franchise of the year HVAC restoration company. Uh, we did an insulation company and we also had a masonry company since 2006. And so that right now on uh, North Shore Brickwork is a masonry company that runs in four states. We're in Illinois, Wisconsin, Texas, yep. and California. And about eight years ago, I was mentoring all of these general managers and other entrepreneurs. And I said, maybe there's, I love coaching and mm -hmm. I thought, maybe there's a, a side gig I can do coaching and that's where the contractor huddle came to be was yeah. my passion of helping other owners in the trades you know get a little bit more handling in their business yeah definitely and you know it's it is very fulfilling to be helping contractors I'm sure obviously with your wherewithal of running you know businesses in multiple states being you know having successful exits not something easy especially for a construction company so yeah definitely uh, I'm sure you've You've been through the trials and tribulations and, you know, cut your teeth, so to say, and now you help contractors circumvent that. And you can see the road ahead, you know, when when other people getting into the trades, you know, just don't have that that experience and that background. And part of that plays into your contractor playbook, you know, the contractor huddle, you, you've got you've got your plays, your playbooks and stuff like that. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, what's the components? What's the idea be behind the, the playbook that you use for your coaching? Yeah. So as I was coaching the boys in football and then in the high school football, everyone has a playbook. Everyone has the uh, substance of what's going to make us successful. And over these 30 years, I've kind of built from other great coaches, other great business owners, contractors, books, the e-myth. Yeah. I kind of found, you know, what are these central components similar mm. to a offensive playbook, a defensive playbook, a special teams playbook, a recruiting playbook. Yeah. We have something similar. So for us, the playbooks are personal mastery, which we really start with is if yeah. we build something uh, really great, but you lose your family and your relationships and your health, you know, it mm -hmm. really wasn't worth it. So we really say, let's work on you as an individual. What's the big vision? Why are we doing this? What's the legacy that you want to leave for your family? And then that also delves into time management. How are they spending their time and calendars using calendars? So that's one of the components really make you the athlete, I call him the athlete, the entrepreneur yeah. athlete, the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Then once we got that dialed in, the number one area, the playbook that we need to master is the financial playbook, Derek, and you know this, yeah. is where where are the leaky buckets in the business? Where can we optimize? It's just small changes could really add to the bottom line for the contractors. And it's yeah. a lot of education. You need to know how to read your financial statements. You need to know where where the cash is coming in. We're really big proponents of the cash flow forecast uh, system that we made. Mm -hmm. That is the other playbook. So we really dial in their financial management. Yeah. Real quickly, the other two playbooks are your sales, marketing, branding. You have to look like a million bucks. Then you have to go out and um, have a great compelling message to, to your target market. And then you have to track all of this information and leads into mm -hmm. um, a, a place where you could stay in front of those clients. So, yeah. and how are you going to get leads? So we have that major playbook. And then the last playbook, which I will say, you know, is our weakest area and it's your strongest area is the systems and processes. So 
I'm, I'm always the visionary, the entrepreneur. You need someone in your company that could really build those systems and processes that the business could run without you. And so yeah. that's a lot of identification of what do you have and what do you need to supplement uh, your business. So with those four building blocks, that's yeah. what makes up the contractor's playbook. Yeah, you hit the big, um, you know, the big functions of the business there, the big marks for a contractor. And, and I love how you've kind of got a holistic approach and you've, you've built, you know, this playbook or it and I'd love to dive into each one because as you know, you know, the it's easy to kind of understand those concepts. You make it simple, but when it comes down to the implementation and actually that knowledge and figuring things out, that's where you really need some guidance and a coach and, and someone to help you along there. So, you know, being an overwhelmed contractor seems like par for the course. You know, it's kind of a meme almost, you could say, as far as, you know, you get the guy that's wearing all the hats and far too busy. And I like that you start with, you know, the personal development and time management, all that stuff, because if, you know, the athlete's not in the right place, if the business owner's not in the right place, they're not going to perform. You know, whether that's their conditioning, whether that's their mindset, whether that's their their ability to show up and, you know, just be organized. So can you tell us a bit about like some of the some of the things that you help contractors so that to help them not be so busy, get more organized, have, you know, a better ability just to manage themselves so that they can then manage their business? Sure. The game changer that I think we really help them with is the identification of where they're spending their time. And if you're a contractor, you are taking on and putting out so many fires on a daily basis that you never are really building something of structure and a foundation to get yourself out of the business so that you could become the owner and not just a self-employed businessman. Yeah. So how we do that is we have them look at their calendar and start using their Google calendar to actually document where are they spending the time. Now, for some contractors, it will only start with, you know, two hour blocks. Like, hey, I did some estimating. I was out in the field checking jobs, blah, blah, blah. But what we're trying to do is get them so detailed that what, how did they spend the last 30 minutes? Yeah. My calendar, believe it or not, it's in 15 minute increments. I want to get that granular because yeah. what the contractor needs to know is how do we get him eliminated from doing those things in the business that he doesn't want to do? For example, mm -hmm. you and I know that if you're the owner that has so many hats, well, most of them, the first thing they want to do is hand off production. They don't want to, they don't want to deal with it, ordering yeah. the materials, the permits, checking on the guys, mm -hmm. making sure the subs show up. So when you yeah. identify how many hours you're spending in production related activities. And we could look at your weekly calendar and we identify those are mm -hmm. all in red, let's call it, because we yep. want to get you out of there. Let's say it comes out, it's 12 hours in a week that they're doing that. Great. We know we can go out now and find someone for about 20 hours a week that could mm -hmm. replace him or yep. her so that they could focus in on the next level of growing, which will be additional business development, estimating, getting out jobs mm. so that we can afford for that person now doing 20 hours, get them in yep. for 40 hours. And we totally have hands off in production. Yeah. I think that's a bit of a, um... Like you're obviously tactical as far as using the Google Calendar and and you know filling out the stuff. There's I think a bit of a mindset as well that you mentioned with just the thought of like having to track something because Peter Drucker, you know, what gets measured gets um, gets improved essentially. And sometimes we get you know as a contractor, it's like yeah, like I know I need to hire a production guy or a foreman or you know an admin person, but you don't really know how much time they're actually going to take off your plate or which tasks are even beneficial. So having, getting that assessment in place as far as like where you're spending time can be very eye-opening. Um, I know I've done this throughout my career as well at some points and you always have a good idea in your head, but it's yeah. not always factually correct. <laughs> Once you actually, you know, put numbers on things and, and start actually seeing like, okay, this is the real deal. Like this is what's, what's happening. This is where I'm putting my time in. So, you know, that's huge. You uh, kind of the second point or what you touched on was the sales and marketing side of things. I know you, you've got Build 12, which is your, your software, CRM software. Can you tell us a bit about what Build 12 does and you know how it helps with getting more sales for contractors and, and keeping their business organized on the, on the kind of the front end marketing and, and sales side of things? Yeah. So one of my keys to success over these last 30 years was always adopting technology to help me run the business more organized, faster, more professional. And over the 
years, CRMs have, and, and now with the trades, we have all of these different kind of software products that we need as owners of construction companies. We need the production software like AccuLinks or Job Nimbus or House Call Pro or Jobber, you know, those kind of things to send yes. out estimates and collect deposits and, and, and get production scheduled. But what those things always have done poorly is nurture leads that didn't close or we have a lead and we didn't schedule an appointment or an estimate yet. And what they don't do a very good job of is re-engaging former customers and uh prospects. So what Build 12 does is bolts on to your existing software that you use to make sure that you're staying in front of the clients in a positive manner through newsletters, through SMS, through text, voice drops, and whatnot to make sure that your customer doesn't forget you. Because what I've learned in 30 years is so many people give up on one time, two times they tried to call the customer, three times, they're done. Yeah. To me, you need to be eight to 12 time touches that they need to see you to remember, oh yes, North Shore Brickwork. That's who we used for, you know, the tuck pointing project, you know, six years ago. Yeah. So that's what Build 12 does. And it's amazing how much low hanging fruit for a contractor to just stay in touch with his existing database that we can re-engage and get some additional sales. Then you hand it off to your production software. They have a great experience. Then Mm -hmm. on the bottom of the funnel, Build 12 comes back in, helps you secure the review, helps you secure some referrals, and then starts that whole process back onto the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. So it was just a missing need in the market place. And yeah. I just felt like I, I could fulfill that need. And we have we have about mm-hmm. 60 clients now using the software. It's got incredible automations that really could free you up on your time that can send out reminders to clients yeah. um, so that you don't have to be remembering this kind of stuff. Yeah, it is some amazing software. And you know, you mentioned a lot of the different features there. It really brings a lot of stuff like stuff all into one software. And it's kind of all the stuff that a lot of the field or project management type softwares generally don't include because they're not made for marketing, for follow-ups, for, you know, the sales process. They're usually like, you know, for estimating, which is like kind of late in the lead cycle already. By the time you're doing an estimate for someone, there's been a lot of like marketing or word of mouth or something's happened anyways, you know, prior to that. And there is definitely that kind of that missing chunk there where there's contractors probably aren't even aware of it, where a lot of potential clients are just kind of dropping off because they're either not being serviced properly. There's not follow-ups. They maybe go into your phone contacts, but you, you know, you forget about them or, or what have you. So definitely a lot of stuff there. And then you mentioned the automations, which I just love about it. You know, there's, you don't have to remember everything. You know, it'll set reminders for you. It can follow up with people. You've got email campaigns you can do so that they're, you know, they're getting nurtured. Not everyone's going to be ready to pull the trigger, you know, on a a project right away. They may be shopping around a little bit. Maybe something came up. They want to do it six months later, you know, and if if you don't have them, something set to check on them, you know, then uh, they're probably going to go somewhere else if they don't remember you six months later. So uh, definitely a lot of features there. I know you've used it yourself. I've heard some success stories. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about maybe some real life use cases of how you use the software or or how you process maybe the the lead nurture to to the sales process with it? Yeah. So one example is Better Basements out in Oregon that really took the ball and ran with it and wanted to, uh, from the beginning, a customer came in, wanted to start educating them on the company and what they should experience and what they're going to get when they deal with the company. So the minute that lead comes in, it gets tagged uh, with a certain tag. And that automation knows that anyone that has those tags begin this communication thread of SMSs and emails to start indoctrinating them on the company before we even show up. Then as it moves through a pipeline, so now the estimate's scheduled, there will be another uh, set of automations, maybe be confirming your appointment. Here's who your estimator is going to be. Here's a little bit about him. The estimate gets done. The estimate gets sent. It goes into the next pipeline. Estimate sent. Waits 24 hours. Confirms how was the bid? Did did you get everything that you wanted? Um, You really want to earn your business? So all those kind of things that would take the owner so yes. much effort to do that or the inside person, now yeah. you're able to build it one time with some forethought and mm-hmm. that whole customer journey from beginning when they don't know anything about your company to the job is completed and it's getting yeah. that review for you is all mapped out and automated. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. And like you said, make things so much easier. Plus, I think it kind of enables the business owner to have a system and have a process. And you can actually like have a software that you can use. And then you can easily have an admin or if you have a salesperson or estimator, it's very team friendly as well, right? Like you can have different users, people can jump in, you can pass off a lead, you know, from an admin to yourself or to a salesperson to an estimator. It integrates with field software. So it's, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of functionality there. Links with your calendar all that kind of stuff. People can book calls and and things like that. So very cool. So I know you've got a lot of experience with on the financial side of things, you know, running books and and managing finances and, you know, running a company, you've got to know your finances. So pretty quickly, if, if you don't got a pulse on, on your profitability and um, cash flow and all those things. So can you dive into a, a bit about good financial management and how you help your clients, you know, make sure that they're in a healthy place financially? It's a lot of blocking and tackling, Derek, that needs to be done, which huh. is surprising that so many contractors are relying on their bookkeeper or their CPAs to help mm-hmm. them stay organized. But when we dig in and every, every week we're digging into the contractors' financials, we find almost the same problems. Even if they're multi-million dollar contractors, yeah. they're not getting the value of QuickBooks and looking at the numbers. Because one, to begin with, their chart of accounts, how they structure things is not in an organized fashion for them to one, know what is the gross profit that they're making off of the projects. So we see every day some materials or labor or things that are related to jobs are down into the general operating expenses and not in a cost of goods sold area. So we spend so much time helping them understand how your financial chart of accounts should be organized. That's one. Two, now that it's organized, we can actually look and see where are you making money and where are you leaking money? And Mm -hmm. is it in your gross profit? We see so many times a contractor thinks he's making 40% gross profit, but then we look at the books, it's really 25 and they they don't even realize that. And that's Mm -hmm. one of them. So really extracting the value of reviewing the financials and having another set of eyes on the books. Mm -hmm. This is the other value that is so warranted for a contractor. Someone else, a peer, a coach, uh, someone that's a sharp CPA, Giving them a review of their financials is one of the best things you can do as a contractor. Then three is, and I harped on it, I think, and a lot of people, if they see me online, is the cash flow forecast. You could Mm -hmm. run, you could go out of business faster if you're growing and scaling than you can as if you're struggling. So what you need to do is QuickBooks doesn't give you the ability to know where your cash situation is on a week to week basis. And so we've come up with a Google. Google Sheet, very simple. We teach your team how to use it. Every Monday it gets updated and you're going to be able to see 12 weeks out in the future what your cash needs are going to be. Are you going to run out of money? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Super important. Anybody who's been in business for any amount of time knows the pain of (laughs) miscalculating cash flow and, you know, having, you know, payday come up and you got guys to pay or subs to pay and uh, the bank account's looking slim. So definitely, you know, want to be an eye on that. And yeah, like you said, once you've got the right setup, you know, with the sheet or the, you know, updates with the team, it just becomes part of the business. And and then you know where you stand. And I like how in the beginning, you you mentioned the chart of accounts, because I remember my contracting business, I I had hired a business coach, and we were looking through the books, and he was asking me about my cost of goods sold. And I was looking at him with a very blank stare on my face. (laughs) I'm like, what are you talking about? And now I see it all the time when I often when I look at, um, you know, set of books is I I don't know if if accountants maybe aren't familiar with construction industry or to other businesses, but so often the labor where there is some sort of, you know, cost that should be attributed to your cost of goods, which is your, your production side of things ends up being in the overhead. So you really don't understand how much exactly. overhead you have, which ties into your estimating. If you're, you know, like you said, if you're, if you're estimating 40% margins, but you don't really know how much your overhead is, you have no idea how profitable you're going to be. And that's, that's giving that your estimates actually accurate, which, you know, as they often, there's going to be some gray areas in there. So yeah, super important to have, have the right setup there. Um, as far as like profitability in a company, what would, what would be some tips or insights as far as like maintaining good profits inside a company after the, you know, the books are set up and it's understanding, like you understand cash flow. What are some things a company can do to kind of improve their, their profitability? I think the major one that gets overlooked so often is actually building the profit in 
in advance through budgeting. Okay. So we really take the time, especially for a contractor that has a few years under their belt, we could take a look at their prior uh, 12 months and then take that information from QuickBooks and build what is their expenses per month for all those categories that we just talked about, office, insurance, fleet, salaries, yep. marketing, and advertising, those six main buckets. Once we know and help them develop the next 12 months, here's the plan. It's going to cost us and let's just use round numbers, 500,000 is our overhead. Now we're going to tell them what profit do you want to make after working your butt off for the next 12 months? And they say, I want to have a quarter of a million dollars of profit. So we're going to build $20,000 every month. So we get to that 240,000. Yeah. So we got the expenses, which we call the nut. We got the profit. And then what, what do you have debt? Do you have some debt pay down that's not interest related? And so let's say that's for rough number's sake, 100,000. So we got 500,000 now. We have 250,000, that's 750 and 100,000 of debt. So that's $850,000. We know for the next 12 months, that's our number. So yeah. in, all we have to do now is take that number and divide it by their gross profit. So for, for your audience, let's take that 850,000. And Derek, if you were, give me a gross profit that you're making with your XYZ construction company. So on uh, 850,000? Just um, overall, as you're running your business, what's your gross profit on, on everything you sell on average? I mean, for a construction company, let's say, I mean, it's going to depend on the company, but say, ideally, I mean, you'd like to be making 10% profit, which would be wonderful. Yeah. 10% 10, 10 net profit. Yes. Uh, the gross profit is probably somewhere between 30 and 40, 30, right? Yeah. I'd say 30, 40, either one. Yeah. Somewhere in there. So if I take that 850 divided by the 30%, that mm -hmm. two point, uh, that's 2.8 million we need to do for revenue. Yeah. So now mm -hmm. we're giving the owner, that's your goal. This is what we need to do. If yeah. you want this goal of meeting this 500,000 of expenses, you want the quarter of a million profit. We want to pay the debt down over the next year and you're at 30% profit. We got to do 2.8. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that contractors don't realize is they'll just have this in their mind and they'll go through the motions of doing this month over month. But now that first month that we put that budget together, we're going to do a yeah. report versus the budget. And we're going to see, are we on pace? Are we behind pace? Or are we ahead of pace? And yeah. then month over month over month, similar to a football team, Derek, is if they lose that first game, they're going to make some changes before they play the next game. If they win that next game, then they're like, okay, we got it dialed in. Let's go to the next opponent. We won. Great. You don't have to change things. When you start losing, that's when you have to change something is going wrong. So you don't wake up and you find out you're two and 10 in the season. Yeah. We could, mm -hmm. we could win if we're 10 and two, mm -hmm. we could win sometimes nine and three, but you can't be three and nine. Yeah. And if you did, like, I love how you've worked backwards there from, you know, what you want and then figuring out what you're going to have to, you know, bring in revenue wise. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, how are you going to win a game if you don't even know where you stand or if, if you, if you're winning if you're winning matches or not right then you expect to to win the super bowl at the end of the year but you're not so sure true. where things are at so analogy. it's a great yeah. analogy for contractors mm -hmm. is you can't wait to the end of the season to see if you're you know you won the super bowl you have to actually make it to yeah. that yeah if you, if you don't know by then you probably didn't but uh but yeah Definitely okay. want to have that stuff in place. And and that's, you know, why having a good coach in your corner is going to make all the difference because contracting is a, it's a full tackle, you know, heads on type of sport. And, you know, you're not going to necessarily always have the time or the wherewithal to be figuring out these plays, figuring out these numbers, you know, it's just, there's a lot of stuff going on every day for sure. Can you tell us a little bit, like, I mean, you've, you've grown a, a number of different businesses now. Can you tell us a bit about what you attribute as like fundamentals to your success or some of the lessons you've learned and and then also, I mean, as you grow in business, your leadership abilities have to grow and, and having the right people. So I know I'm kind of putting a very broad question here, but can you tell us a bit about your growth curve with your businesses and, and just some of the lessons you've learned? Yeah, let me hope, hope to get you three to end with on a, with a bang. But yeah. one is knowing, know thyself. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is <clears throat> it took me a while to understand. And, and one of the greatest assessments I've ever taken, and I have all of my key 
people take is called Strength Finders by Gallup. And what that is, it's not this disc where it tells you you're a driver, you're an influencer, but it tells you what are you really strong at. And one of the things that you should be identifying is what are those things that give you energy that you're great at? And what are those things that you're not good at? Because so many people say, work on your weaknesses. But my mentality over the years was, I'm just going to be great at what I am great at. And then I'm going to supplement or complement myself with the people that are great at the things that I'm not good at. And so in all the businesses that I do, I realize I'm the activator. I'm the visionary. I'm the maximizer. I could take great ideas, get them going. But then the day to day needs someone that's detail oriented, that likes the grind, that likes the structures and processes, you know, that you know about, because that's not my strength. So Mm -hmm. that's been really freeing is is really identify what are you great at and what what do you what are you passionate about so that that's yeah. your sweet that that's been a great lesson for me and I really mm-hmm. try to you know live within my strengths and uh, not my weaknesses <clears throat> number two was through my business coach many many years ago he taught me the value of cash flow forecasting and so every business that I do no matter if it's the small bill 12 CRM or it's the large masonry company or it's the coaching business or a sports training facility that I've done. We yeah. always do a cash flow forecast for that business so that I could see and I could sleep at night. Is there uh, money coming in and what do I need to do way in advance? <laughs> Lastly, my father gave me the best advice, just his giving me so much value. He was he was a policeman in Chicago, tough, tough as nails. And he really taught me about the business and he started the roofing business from scratch. Yep. If you're in the contracting business, you are going to have problems that come at you every day. And it's very easy to dismiss them and hope they go away and keep focusing on the next job and you know try to put this one away, hoping that it goes away. But his advice to me was, as a Chicago policeman, was, attack problems head on. So if you have any inclination, this job's going south or this customer's going to be a problem, what's really served me was jump in there. Even though it's painful right now, go talk to that customer, go drive over there. Don't go into the emails. Don't go calling your attorney to see what you should do. Get out in the field and take that problem head on and work out the solution. And then for you peacefully and stress relief that that thing has been dealt with. And now you can move on to the next problem because our job as owners of construction company is problem solving. And the more you can attack problems and go after it and not not hope that your your employees are doing it well is going to serve you really, really well. Yeah, fantastic points across the board there. And just to, to touch on the, the last one there, it is very freeing and will build confidence immensely when you can do that. It doesn't feel good, usually in a confrontational type of things. Not that it's always necessarily confrontational, but just uncomfortable even or uneasy. And I know I've done this where, you know, you got to call a client and um, something's gone wrong on site or with the budget or what have you. And generally 95% of the time, if, if you're open and upfront about it, they're understandable and they may not enjoy it, but they know that at least, you know, you get, you're on the same side. You both want the same thing at the end of the day and, and you're working together. So, I mean, that's one case. It could be with employee, it could be with, you know, suppliers, whatever, right? But instead of the death by a thousand paper cuts, better just to, like you said, confront it, get it over with. You're going to feel the pain, whether that's going to be short and, you know, a bit intense or or drawn out and generally things fester and get worse over time. Uh, not better if, if you don't um, do something about it, right? So, yeah. yeah. Great Wonderful advice. point there. Can you um, tell us a little bit about when you, like there's certain points in a business, right? With um, as a business owner grows, generally you're going to start self-employed. Maybe you got a couple field guys. At some point you're going to need an admin, and then there's going to be a level of leadership that you're going to need, like management, whether that's you know an operations manager, project manager, a general manager. Can you tell us maybe a bit about how you've like key personnel that you've hired in your businesses to help you kind of you know with those key management spots and how you how you found the people or how you 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 look for them and then how you've been able to kind of like be a leader of leaders and and enable a team to take care of 
the business and, and not everything rely on yourself. I think the most common, at least in my experience as well, but in coaching and mentoring so many other contractors, and this isn't the only path, but it's one of the best paths. So the owner goes from doing everything to hiring a great right-hand gal, and she starts mm-hmm. taking some of all of his tasks and answering the phones, ordering the permits. And so she's getting an idea with scheduling. And so mm-hmm. that person now uh, will morph into to potentially an office manager that is almost like his executive VA. Mm-hmm. That's that's who we're trying to mentor. And yep. so now she goes from managing everything to the books, making sure the books are 100% dialed in and mm-hmm. some uh, job super supervision, ordering materials and that. Yep. But then the next key position is a production superintendent, or you could call them when you get even bigger operations manager. Yep. That person is going to be making the decisions, scheduling the uh, the materials, making sure the sh- subs show up, that the jobs are great, They're, he or she is responsible for the reviews, that the customers are raving fans. And so now we have this person, all of the production is handed off to him. Maybe that office manager type is uh, now uh, his or her assistant. So you got those two main areas, your finance admin and your production now totally handed off. You're concentrating on sales, business development. And so now we're bringing on some other estimators, some salespeople, so that you are now moved into the position of lead gen. I always say the CEO has three main responsibilities, bringing in the money, the the economic engine, the leads, hiring A players, and then holding them accountable. So now you move into this role of business development. You're working on the leads, the pay-per-click, the direct mailing, the cold calls. You're making sure the leads are coming in for the new estimator or the two new salespeople. And so yeah. once you do that, you now, mm-hmm. let's say you get to three or four estimators, salesmen, now you bring in a sales manager. So you got a sales manager, production manager, office manager, you're on the top, you are now free yeah. from not doing the day-to-day, you're managing three people. Yeah, you're, you're, you work yourself out of a job essentially is is the, is the goal and you, and you hire someone to replace you and, and create a system process. But can, can you tell us a bit about your process or how you go about finding those those right people or when you're interviewing them like how, how do you choose and you know the right people that for those key positions it, especially if you're if you haven't like if you if you're just building your business often you you haven't really worked with people in these key positions because you've been doing it all yourself so how do you go about finding the right person or, or know who's going to be you know a good fit well one thing that i learned about as per my st- strength mantra before is I'm terrible at identifying uh, people that will be a good fit for the organization. So I, because I'm a salesperson, I'm an optimist. No I, 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 I really want to believe someone that they are who they say they are. <laughs> so I've gotten wiser in that role where now I pull in other experts that are HR experts and they compliment me to, to really vet the people that you need around you. Now, some yeah. people are good at it. I, I'm just admitting, you know, here to you, Derek, that yeah. I'm terrible at that. So mm-hmm. uh, there's all these great companies that you know about. They're in the industry. If people wanted to uh, hit you and me up, we we know they're great at hiring for the construction industry, all these key positions. Yeah. But I will say to you, one of the key drivers of success of when you bring on a new people, a new person into your business mm-hmm. is having a really comprehensive job description where they understand this is how I win when I'm working for you. And this is what I'm going to be held accountable to. And then you, the owner, actually hold them accountable to these results so that they know, are they doing a good job or not? What I've done poorly, what I see a number of owners do poorly is they hire the person and they just leave them go and hope for the best. (laughs) And uh, this is is when it uh, blows up in our face. So yeah, no, like you mentioned before, know thyself and and super smart to to have a team and other people to rely on and uh you know i i've had that happen to me especially early on you know you you want to trust people and you if you, you're generally a likable type person and you like people and you know if you think things are like you said optimistic of yeah they should be able to do it but uh there are a lot of there's a lot of detail that can go into the hiring process and as you mentioned you know you staffing agencies and there's there's people that are you know specifically do this you know for a living and there's a lot of depth there to finding the right 
right people and then what you mentioned as well is often there'll be your people are advertising for a job they're not really advertising for an, a person necessarily and haven't gone through that work of like who is going to be the right person you know what kind of characteristics or experience or um, criteria are you evaluating you know the right person on more than just you know them being friendly and and you know looking the part and saying the right things right but uh, can they actually back it up with some experience or you know certain characteristics that are attributed to success i'll tag on to that one other thing that came to mind that you just sparked was those core values that you've already identified in your company of this is the kind of person that really excels in our business you know adaptability let's say or they attack right. problems head on well once you identify those core values now in that interview process you could try to elicit how they've exemplified those characteristics in their previous businesses that they've yeah. worked for to see is this person going to fit into our culture yeah that that's a really key differentiator there too is like when you're asking interview questions ask them to give you a real life example or story of a time that they did whatever worked hard had a problem on site whatever because it's very easy to say what you would do in a situation it's yeah. different to to obviously like give someone this is actually what happened and what i did right so it's a lot and depending on the response and how detailed they are you can kind of get a good feel of like you know are, are they actually capable or have had this situation happen and what are what's the behavior that they're going to that they that their tendency for behavior you know in these situations and stuff like that but uh yeah, yeah so much more, more depth here what's a good way for people to reach out to you if they want to learn more about the coaching or, or you know build 12 and, and your, your software solution there what, what's the best way for people to, to connect with you or, or your companies well a couple things i suggest one is i'm i'm a big believer in linkedin right now for contractors it's where you should be planting a flag for your business there's the business pages that's great for your seo yep. but it's great for the owners to be connecting with their perfect target market which is if they're in the residential market it should be realtors and real estate agents i'm, I'm sorry architects and yep. if you're in the commercial space there's property managers and facility managers all of my recommendations and testimonials uh, live on linkedin so connect with me there at les o'hara i'd love to be connected with you it's great there and then they could go to contractorhuddle.com shows you all of the things that we do for a contractor and all the the different kind of resources and people that we can help align their company with to help them get to the next level yeah Perfect. So we'll put the, the links in the description, uh, whether you're listening or watching this and, uh, you know, go click through those, get, check them out, you know, get some help with your business. You know, coaches, essentially, they, they collapse the timeline, you know, first on how many mistakes and difficulties you're going to encounter and just the amount of time it's going to take, right, to, to get to where you want to go. Can you maybe finish off things for us with uh, a story of a client that you worked with, maybe some of the challenges or problems they were facing in their business and and how you were able to help them, you know, get to, you know, a better state and, and grow their business? Well, one that I, I wore this hat purposely today to honor yeah. him. He's a young buck. He's got a great business in the Tahoe area area, Sierra Crest Tree Service. And I just was coaching him yesterday on our monthly one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> and the value that I would say our team has brought to his team was one, the cash flow forecast is very eye-opening. Two, uh, as we were reviewing the financials yesterday, he is getting mentored on how to understand the books. And there's a lot of aha moments when you can have someone that has been a little bit of advanced of you kind of ask you key questions uh, when you're talking about the financials. Third is his sister who's in the business is really engaged with Build 12 and the CRM and all of the value of following ups and staying on top of all of the leads and uh, proposals that are out there. Yep. We're, we're tying that all up. But then what you just said is shortening the time frame. I gave him a couple of tips about why he should be a subchapter S corporation for tax savings because he's having a great year. I can't make any claim to it. I'd like to, yep. but you know, he's going to owe a lot of taxes potentially. And so yep what you should be doing to prepare for this kind of thing. And that just takes a little bit of Your mentoring calendar. to uh, understand someone that has been there and done that could help you avoid these mistakes that is going to cost you tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Definitely. Again, pre-planning, asking the right questions. You know, it's uh, there's lots of answers out there. You can go to Google and find an answer for just about everything. But uh, asking the right questions is uh, is often where those those eye-opening moments can come up. So. 
Thanks so much for coming on, Les, for sharing your knowledge, for helping all the contractor world and, and our listeners. Really appreciate you, you coming on today. Derek, again, thanks, buddy. Safe travels back to Vancouver, and I'll see you in 2025. You bet.